Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to start in a new chapter and it's going to be on types. Now we sort of talk about type before. Well, we did talk about types, but we didn't spend too much time talking about defining new types. We in chapter two, we look at integer type, Boolean and those sort of fundamental basic type that Go language provides. And then we eventually had broke out into more complex type that a language also provide those composite type like um, array slices, arrays, um, structure, map, and I would even um, and and channel is also a type, right? And you could think of it as a storage type, right? You save stuff in it, but it's also a type. You create variables of that type, um, and so anything you could create a variable of is a type. And so what are we really doing when we talk about new types? When we use a map, for example, we're always creating a new type. And even when we use a slice, we're creating a new type. When we create an array, we're creating a new type. And those types were the slices, map, and array. Those were, and even channel, those were unnamed types. And we're gonna flush out unnamed versus named types in the coming um, sections in this chapter. Now, um, what is a type? Well, and that's one of the things we're going to try and look at in this section. And of course, we're going to clarify it and refine it as we go ahead. So don't expect to have all of this answer in this very first episode only. And we're also going to look at how you define new types. And again, we're going to continue doing that in the rest of the chapter. So I pull this out from the Go language specification. And the link is right at the bottom there. And it says, a type determines the set of values and operation specific to values of that type. So a type determine the set of values that you can have. So when you're talking about a Boolean type, the set of values available to you are just the two, truth and true and false, right? Those are the set of values. And then once you have uh, values and you have a type, it defines, so it def the type determines the values and the operation specific that you can do on those values. So once you have Boolean values, true and false, what are the operation you can do? The allowed operation are the Boolean operations, which are your and, or, not, those are, like, uh, um, those are the only operation you can really do with um, your Boolean type, right? Um, so integer type, if you have an integer type, depending on what type of integer it is, if it's an 8-bit integer, it defines a set of values that you can use. 8-bit value, if it's unsigned versus signed, well, we'll be talking about unsigned from 0 to 255 8-bit, or unsigned minus 127 to plus 127 inclusive, and what operations you're allowed to do, you know, multiply, addition, and so on, right? Um, the basic arithmetic operations. So, um, now, somebody might say, well, okay, I can do exclusive, nor and all this other stuff, exclusive or and all this other thing. True, but we're, we're going to leave out binary operations, okay? So you can always treat a number as a binary value and do other binary operations on it, but we're going to ignore that for now. And if you don't know anything about binary operations, like or and 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 exclusive or and stuff, please ignore it. Pretend that you didn't hear any of that stuff. Well, all I was trying to do is give more examples of when you have a type, your set of values are bounded, and there's certain operations that are allowed on those values. So I want to go back a bit, and I'm going to step out of here because I don't want to go through all the animation I had in some of those chapter eight. And I want to go back to slide 40. And so here's slide 40, and this is my definition of a value. A value is an abstraction to represent a computed result. Not all values are computed, however. Some values just represent themselves. When a value stands for itself, we call it a literal. A literal is also a value. It's just in that specific instance when, like here, varil is a literal. So I give some examples of values. And so this was back in chapter 2, early chapter 2. I also want to jump down to slide 62 here. And we're talking about here with data and types. What is data? Data is just another name for value. So we're really talking about values and types there. Okay. What is a type, you know, or a type of a value or a type of data? And this is my own definition. It 
type or data type is the formal specification of the inter of the interpretation and representation of a value how is it represented and stuff and the reason i put that here is because in this chapter i went into showing how everything is a number and how it's represented but in other words a value of a certain type must meet all the characteristics of that type a type defines which operations are valid we come back to which operations are valid again for a type based on um, the type you have a certain type of operation that could only be performed for that type. Okay, so let's jump back down to the bottom and continue reading. So let's let this catch up for a second here. And we're here. And let's go back to presentation mode. So now we're clear with the first sentence, I hope. The second sentence says, types may be named or unnamed. Now, I said that we were creating unnamed types when we did things like an array, a slice, a map. We were creating unnamed types. And you will see what that means in the coming videos. We'll look at a little example today, but don't worry. We'll do plenty of examples to make sure that you get it. And we're all on the same page. We're going to all learn together. Even I'm going to look forward to learning something new as we go through these, this chapter. And out of chapters, so in every chapter, I always learn something new. Name types are specified by a possible qualified type name. We're going to see that. Now, we have actually done name type also. We've done a lot of unnamed types when we did slices, arrays, maps, and channels. But we've done name types when we did structure. So as I showed yesterday in our little preview to this chapter, if we did a structure without a name, it's kind of cumbersome. But once we give it a name, we can reuse it very easily. That was a name type. We also saw that though you can give a name to a function and have a function type but we're gonna again see all that again name types or name types are specified by using a type literal that's exactly what we did we literally type out the type which is composed of new types and existing types okay so an example would be I have a name type called person and then I do a slice of person and so now I have an unnamed type of slice person but that unnamed type is built up of, you know, existing type, which was the slice type, or I could have a map, for example. A better example would probably be a map of strings to person. And so map of strings to person is an unnamed type itself, but it's composed of existing type, which is the string, and the new type, which is person, to create yet a more complex type, which is unnamed, called map of string to person. And I could turn map of string to person to a name type by giving it a name. Are we going to see all of that? A lot of this, I'm just trying to tell you what we're going to do. So when we do it, it's going to be the second time you're seeing it. And then, you know, hopefully that reinforces it. So tell you what you're going to tell you, tell it to you, and then tell you what I just told you. <laughs> okay. So hopefully without that repetition, um, I think. So let's see. What is the next slide here? Ah, that's in chapter two. That's for another day tomorrow if I get to record but so let's kind of jump in and look at a little example example well can't speak but before I do before I do so here's where I got this information if you go over to the Go language specification which is just Go language and you know if you click on docs documents and then scroll along to specification you'll end up here and then you can click right here and you can go to types and it gives you this little blurb that I just went through with you and it shows you the BNFF, whatever, back of NORF notation for um, how this is broken down, what a type looks like. You don't really care about this right now. Uh, eventually, when you learn to read that stuff, you care, but don't worry about it. Um, and it tells you, show you some example of how you define a type, which is exactly what we saw in our preview and before when we did structs, is type keyword, the name that you're going to give it, and then the type that you're specifying whether it's an existing type, composition of some existing type or whatever, right? So for example, I have type T3 is a slice of T1. So this is exactly what I'm talking about where it reuses a new type. Um, thing. Now, if I had a variable of just this guy like this, um, uh, that would be an unnamed type. Never mind, we're going to get back into all this. Now, let me back up a little bit. And so on the type, you'll see it says method set. We're not going to talk about that because methods, we're not going to get into methods until 
chapter 10 or 11, something there, or maybe 12, we'll see. Um, but we surely spoke about Boolean types, numeric types, different type, numeric types, floating point number, um, integers, and um, complex numbers. We talked about string type and we've used them. Array types, we've used them. Arrays and we use slices. Structure types, we've talked about pointers in chapter two, how to create a pointer. And we've seen using pointer in the last chapter eight when we had to use a pointer to our weight group and saw how important that was. Instead of passing a copy, we pass a pointer to the weight group. Function type, we kind of use and we're going to see more of it. So interface type, we're not going to talk about interfaces until we sort of get into talking about methods. We talk about interfaces first and then sort of methods and maybe we do them in the same chapter or uh, maybe separate chapters, but um, probably makes sense to do them together. But um, we certainly have to talk about interfaces first before we sort of talk about method, in my opinion. And then map types, which we have covered, and channel types. Okay, so we've covered most of these types, except really talking about method sets, which is not a type, um, and interface type we didn't really cover, and function type we didn't cover in detail. Okay, and so now this talks about properties of types and values. This is where we're gonna sort of start pick up tomorrow. We're gonna talk about type identity, but I just wanna show you. Feel free to go ahead and read it. But let's just try and look for an example. So I created a new directory called chapter nine. I created a session di directory here, um, zero one, there's nothing in it. And so I'm pull up my code editor. And so let's just start coding uh, a simple example. And we're gonna start off by doing main.go. And what I'm gonna do is actually, uh, let's, uh, okay, let's simply keep it simple for this. But for going forward, I might make things a little complex in terms of how I organize our directories with a like CLI directory and so on. And that's going to be for way, way down there. And I'm start preparing you for, for that by do, using a different directory structure. But enough said on changing directory structure. Let's just do the example. So you do package and main and func and main entry point. So our package main entry point in our application function main in that package says where you want to kick things off and fmt that print ln and this is on um, defining new types All right whatever i think our, our thing is called and of course we know this is going to run if you don't have confidence that that would run by now uh, sorry please go back and think so what do i say we can do when we create a new types we can say for example that we want to create a new type and um, let's say I want to have in my program a type called student ID so I can say type student ID and what is that type gonna be is it a string or an int well let's just say for now it's an integer so I can make it an int okay here I can say I have student one zero colon equals to student ID that gets the value 25 for example okay and then FMT that print F and I'll do student zero percent T percent V that's the value and maybe I do this and so I'm going to say student zero, student zero. And so what I'm trying to get is go to the language to tell me what the type of student zero is and also to print out the value. Okay. And so let's go here and run this. And so we see that our student zero, the type is main that student ID and, um, Type to run. The reason I got a percentage in there is because I just need to kind of hand it nicely with a new line. And so, okay. So, so that's not too surprising. What might be surprising to you? So now we have a name type, which is student ID. That is a name type. What might be surprising to you is if I were to write a function, it says function print student ID. And I say, well, 
I know student ID is really an int. Why don't we just pass an int i? So id is an int. And well, actually, maybe I want to actually say student ID here. Uh, student ID. And I'm going to move this function, this into here. And now I want to print uh, uh, what am I doing? Uh, ID, student ID, ID, ID. So this is going to print student ID. We, of course, know the type already, so that's kind of redundant. And so what I want to do is call print student ID and let's say 25 and print student ID and I'm going to use student ID 0. And you may look at these two, you may think those are the same exact same thing and they should work. Okay. And if you run your program, you're going to see it does work, right? Because the underlying type for student ID is an int. So Golang can create a student ID when I make a call here out of this 25. But interestingly, interestingly, look at this and you're going to scratch your head for a while and we're going to cover it and clear it up tomorrow for you to see what's going on. There's an explanation. I'm going to create a new variable called ID. I'm going to give it 25 and then I'm going to pass ID here. And then I want to do something. Uh, I want to do print. Uh, I'm going to be super lazy. I just copy this up here and I'm going to say, where's the ID ID. So now, I'm going to print out the type of ID and I'm also going to print out the value of ID. And I'm getting a red line here, but we know we can't trust the red lines in my program because something with my formatting and the formatter is just messed up that I have to go and check. But I've been saying I'm going to do that and I haven't gotten around to it. But I can guarantee you this program is not going to run. And so there you go. It says cannot use ID, which is type int, as type for student ID and argument. So what is going on here? Here, I've clearly passed an integer to print student ID, and it worked. I've taken an integer, cast it to a student ID, and stored it here, and that somehow become a student ID, which I can pass in here, and it worked. Now, all I'm doing is taking the same int I've used here, store it to, this is an integer. This is absolutely an integer I'm passing to student ID. And I've stored, and, and the front under my, um, underlying type of student ID is an int. So why isn't Go taking, it's, it's telling me that ID is an int. So why isn't it taking this variable ID that I've given it and convert it into the exact same thing which I've done here? This is simply an indirection. Instead of passing 25, the integer directly here, I'm passing it to a variable and then passing it here. And that has to do with some rules that we're going to cover tomorrow. This has to do with name types and unnamed types, and they're not being equal. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you so that when you hear it, you think. And this kind of makes sense. Once you see all the rules and stuff and you understand it, um, don't resist the rules. Just accept it. <laughs> Once you see the rules, it's going to make sense, and it explains why. And so let me comment out this, and our program is suddenly going to work, of course. Uh, come on. It didn't save yet. Um, okay, so that's going to work, and as you can see, the type is int, which it told me here. But it explains why when we try to do time that sleep, for example, and we do 25, you know, times time that nanoseconds to sleep for 25 nanoseconds, why well, that work? But if we time, do time that sleep, and we try to do id times time that nanoseconds, why this does not work, even though they're both integers, okay? And you can see here's the red line jumping around. Again, you can't trust my thing, but I guarantee you this will not work. It will complain again because it's saying time that nanosecond mismatch type int and time duration 
and that's why we always had to cast our um, stuff to time that duration first which is the same as our student here we had to cast it for sort of and then you have to take that integer the underlying type and create make it our type that we want and then say that times time that nanoseconds we know knew this worked this way we just didn't know why and we still don't know why yet except that we've been able to demonstrate it with our own type and so we'll see the rule for that tomorrow okay i don't want to make this too long i know this is not very exciting and maybe it feels like a little bit of a letdown but um i want to ease us into talking about types and make sure that we come out on the other side feeling very very confident about how we handle types and i hope you feel the same thing with go routines you come out on the other side of that feeling huh this is, was pretty cool i don't know everything there is to know but i know enough that i can go off and start messing with go routines all right, again, thanks for your time. I'm going to end this here. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye.